Welcome to the World Builders Anvil, episode 249, the six attributes of world builders. Don't know where to start building your fantasy world? Do you need more? Does it make sense? Forget any worries and become a crafter of imagination. This is the place where we will prime your mind. Now, it's time to heat up the forge, break out the mithril ingots and hammer. Welcome to the World Builders Anvil. I'm Jeffrey W. Ingram. And I'm Michael Miller. Let's sup from the muck of Java and build. Welcome back. As always, I'm Michael Miller. Uh, 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 what? You still have a concussion? Huh? Oh, wait. No, I'm Jeffrey Ingram. That's right. And unconcussed. W Ingram. That's right. Don't forget my W, sir. W. And unconcussed. Don't I say it that way. I used to know before I even knew. You want me to say W? <laughs> uh, That's an American politics thing. That's an American politics joke, and I really, I have nothing necessarily against him, but I don't have anything really for him either. I yeah, that's kind of where I'm at too. I, I hate a W though. Uh, w. W. Uh, nothing against people who say it that way. Uh, just not in reference to me. Okay. Uh, do, we, do we have any house cleaning before we get into things? Uh, house cleaning. Uh, yeah. If you want to vacuum around my house, that would be awesome. I'm not going to vacuum in around your house. That's not Don't going to happen. offer. Uh, no, I mean like show housekeeping stuff, you know, like, uh, like shouting people out is a housekeeping item. I I did just let two in today. I don't know their names because I don't. That's a, that's okay. I I I know I did shouting out like mm -hmm. a um the last the last episode. The last you did episode. a huge yeah. one. Yeah, There's been at least two since then. Well, if you don't know what they are, Jeff, then move on. I'm saying other. I didn't know if there were any other things that needed to be addressed. Okay. Uh, no. Yeah, let's get into <laughs> it. You this just is something. Get if you just want I've to get into it, we can get into it. I just wanted to make sure we didn't miss anything before we started. That's all. <laughs> I've been hyper obsessing on this, and you're trying to derail me. Screw you. Um, oh, hey. Okay. Yeah, no, it's uh, – and this started for me like several weeks ago, actually. Uh, and, and for the people who are listening, several weeks before uh, you hear this episode and, uh, and before I recorded it as well. But essentially – uh, there's this uh, personality thing. I don't know if you know who Gretchen Rubin is from the Happiness Pod or the Happier Podcast, um, but it's a, a pretty good podcast out there. And she has this three tendency quiz, and she says everyone is one of, or it's like four tendencies. There's like you are a tendency as a person, and knowing this will help, you know, help you perform better in your life. And so, of course, I take this because I'm a sucker for those kinds of quizzes. But it started making me think, you know, really fundamentally what makes us world builders? And it's not like what gets us started. I think there may be different paths into world building, but as world builders, you know, I think there are certain fundamental things that are in common and, and, and knowing them helps us understand the types of worlds we'd probably like, like to make more. And more importantly, you know, it'll, it'll give us some information on, on what we need to do ultimately to be able to finish it. Uh, and so as part, part of figuring this out, I came up with like these six attributes and I just had to do an episode on it because I'm very excited about it. And some of these we've talked about before and I'll talk about where I got some of the inspiration for some of the other ones as we go through. But if you're playing at home, there's like no downloadable content for this episode. Just keep a scorecard one to six and rate yourself one to 10 on everything. And I'll kind of let you know where, where you kind of sit, you know, you know, on these spectri, um, which spectri? is... That's, Spe that's multiple for um, uh, spectrum. Multiple, I'm pretty so sure. The, the pluralization. The I mean, plural. What you were shooting for? Well, if I was going to say spectri for the plural, I figured I shouldn't say uh, the actual word plural because that would uh, – so I should you, just you say could, spectrums. You, you could say pluralized. Yeah. And this first one might not really be a spectrum, but I kind of like to think of it because, you know, sometimes you kind of lean in a way, but you're not necessarily hardcore there. So I don't believe in, you know, binary answers usually. So I like spectrums. So the first one, and we've talked about this one before in the show, is, you know, what type of worlds do you prefer to make? You know, I think that's a huge influence on how we make worlds. Um, and for that is, you know, and I call that the world style trait. You know, and there's alien, Earth-like, or, or Earth-based. I'm pretty much hardcore in the Earth-like setting. 
even though I definitely had world building I've done and there are interests I have in, in, in stories. So I've started developing uh, some earth-based stuff. So I probably lean, lean a little bit, you know, a little bit towards earth-based, but I'm definitely right near the earth-like in the settings personally. But the idea is, is just personal preference, you know, what's attracting you to world building, you know, what type of worlds like make you go, yes. You know, there are some people who really like to try and come up with alien and unique style worlds that are completely deviated. Some people, when I think of Earth-like, it's sort of like Token or Westeros, uh, even though I guess Token isn't a world, but um, well, Middle you know, Earth. I would say Tolkien <laughs> is a world because it's not, you know, the continents are not laid out the same. Uh, well, it's definitely a world, but I'm saying it's not called Token. Westeros is the actual name of a world. Right, Middle Earth would be. But yeah. Those are sort of like classic Earth-style ones that are in the lexicon right now as we're recording this. Um, but sometimes people want to try and, and deviate more because typically most Earth-like uh, fiction falls into sort of medieval European fantasy. And, you know, so you might, you know, link a little more towards Alien if you start trying to break from what you know. Uh, not necessarily what exists, but what you know. Um, and then Earth-based is you know, like, you know, definitely Harry Potter. Um, you know, you know, it's, it's on earth. There are pockets of earth, which aren't necessarily accessible to us muggles, but, uh, there are, there are these worlds that, you know, um, or these people who can sort of do things that we can't and, and they can actually go areas that we can't go even as well too. So there's like pockets that you can kind of create in earth through earth based, but you don't even necessarily need to be able to create pockets or you, you know, you might have a mixture of both too, which kind of puts you back towards the middle, which is like, okay, maybe there's like a plane that you can travel back and forth to. And I think Dawn did this in, in, in her books where you could sort of go to this other world, which was not like earth, you know, but earth was at the center of the story. Mm, I would say that that was, I would call it earth. I would call it earth. You call that earth. Like I would call it, earth well, I would call it earth. Based. Because here's the thing, mm -hmm. while it was an ethereal realm, everything that was in there was built by the knowledge of the real world. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I, I guess that's fair. But you could, you could have a situation like that, like, like a Werewolf did this where you would step sideways, but you could still even argue that was Earth-based, but it wouldn't necessarily need to be. Um, Mm, what space? Like, it could be like another plane of existence, like Oblivion and the game Oblivion. Actually, I was just about to ask you: What would you consider the Umbra? Would you would you consider that Earth based or or just? Because I think it's the way the game. Oh, it's a the, way the, the game master ran it. Um, you know, I I, I don't remember. I, I didn't play Werewolf much, so I don't remember much about uh, if there were requirements because you kind of you would step sideways into it. Yeah, but you could argue that depending on the way the game master would run it, it would become more alien like um, outside in the supernatural. Um, but whatever it's on the way it's, it's rolled, but really for that one, it's really what's your preference. And that kind of sets a baseline for how you uh, like to roll, you know, and the second attribute, and I call this the need trait is neat, um, neat, neat and -E -E. need. need. Yeah. And actually the, the next two are based completely off of um, the architect to gunslinger. And so we've talked about that before, uh, but I like to break it down into two because I don't think it has to necessarily be the same, what you create with what you share. Cause some architects maybe don't want to share much of the secrets of their world. So there's a lot of stuff that they know that they don't actually share out directly. Uh, so I think there's a disconnect with with the architect to gunslinger spectrum um and i so i broke it down into two and the first one is a need you know before you start sharing your world with other players or writing a story about it or creating your movie or your video game how much of it do you need individually just sort of psychologically do you need to have really it really all locked down tight you know and then that way you, you follow what i call scripted and on the other end is an impromptu person, which, you know, that's your gunslinger who really, you know, is, is, is just going off of stimulus at the moment. 
Um, much more uh, improv. Much more of an improv. And then in the middle, extemporaneous. And yes, I kind of base this off of speech making those terms. Um, but, um, you know, where you definitely have a background of stuff. And that's kind of actually where I sit, where I, I know lots of stuff about my world. But most of it is just off of understanding patterns I have set up in the background. Um, and if you can convincingly do that, someone like Michael thinks you're a hardcore architect, but you don't have the paperwork to back it up. Um, now, um, the third trait is the similar idea, but it's when you share and you know, it's like, do you feel like you need to, to share this stuff out? And, you know, so for me, I call it, you know, the realistic to fantastical spectrum. You know, and at one end, you have the realistic look where that's people who are stuck on this needs to be realistic and believable, which, you know, I'll do an episode on this at some point because I, I, I think that's a bogus thing to think about in fiction. Uh, I, I see what people want to strive for, but especially in fantasy fiction and even in many cases for science fiction, people's real understanding of, of science fiction is, is so loose that, you know, and, unless it's a need for you. Uh, there's no reason to do it, to be heavily re, uh, realistic or believable in what you share. On the other end is the fantastical, sort of like Alice in Wonderland, you know, where it's it, it, it might not even connect well. It works as a cohesive world, but it it doesn't connect well in normal logic. Logic in the real world is broken, you know, when you go visit a uh, Wonderland. Um, and so for me, I kind of I probably. I like that's why I call it naturalistic. So I'm probably around the middle of this one too, where I kind of lean a little towards fantastic because there's certain things like magic where I have systems for, but I don't necessarily share them out uh, uh, directly to people. I kind of like that to be hidden. So it creates a fantastical element that you get out of classic fantasy, which you don't get anymore because you know, people know the laws of magic now. Mm-hmm. They, they, they have all the laws. Yeah, you know, they know the rules and the way things work. And I thought Harry Potter did a great job with that where it kind of felt like there was a system, but they didn't really explain it and, and mm. couldn't always necessarily put the pieces together consuming the fiction. And I have no problem with that. And that's why I kind of get worried when people get stuck on believable because, you know, the stuff that's working doesn't necessarily do that. Um, and, and, and especially f- from a classic sense. But even modern today, there's stuff coming out, you know, massive uh, uh, believability issues in Star Wars and Star Trek and all of it, um, and for good reason. Um, you know, even if you go realistic, the problem is, like, you go hardcore science-based science fiction, you know, there's going to be a discovery next year that throws that into the uh, ticker. So, um, you know, you go with what you know. and But on this on 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 the sharing trait it's about what you feel to share to the person you you know you might have hardcore science based reasoning behind everything but you might not share so much of it so you might start leaning even towards the fantastical uh you know with that which uh what's that movie i'm thinking of interstellar you know uh which is sort of really theoretical astrophysics stuff and 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 and, and very you know cutting edge theoretical stuff that they're talking about, but there's all science base in it. And, and, and so realistic in that way, but if you watch the movie, it's completely fantastical, at least for my simple lay mind. Hmm. Uh, now, uh, my simple the fourth trait, this is what I like to call, um, this is what I like to call the creative trait. And the creative tray is how do you access your creativity? Um, all world builders are creative. I think all people are creative. Um, and we'll get to why people might struggle with that later on. But uh, it's, you know, how do you get inspired? Some people are very, very concrete. And other people are very abstract. Like I can pull out elements of colors I like from a picture and be inspired to create from it. I, I lean, lean very heavy towards abstract. Um, other people, um, you know, it's, it's, it's when they're reading, uh, uh, middle earth or they're, they're watching star Wars, they're inspired and, and, and their work 
isn't necessarily derivative, but is inspired from something concrete made up, which is kind of funny to call something made up concrete, but <laughs> something that they could visualize in their mind, which got their wheels going. Um, and so, you know, I think it's a really important one to understand. And so sometimes when I consider stuff inspiration, other people might not see it because I see inspiration differently than other people do. I can derive inspiration differently. And, and, and really in all things, it's sort of what catches your eye ultimately. So for whether you're abstract or concrete, the fifth trait is, I have no idea how to pronounce this word. I probably should have looked it up before (laughs) is the um, phallus. Um, phallus, oh. uh, which is a Greek word that talks about center. Um, and yeah, yeah. And it looks like I put the wrong, but yeah. You know, it's sort of like, what, what is the thing that you center your world building around? Which number is this? Uh, this is the fifth one. The fifth one. O-M-P-H-A-L-O-S. Um, phallus. Uh, that's how you pronounce it in English. I, I know it derives from the Greek, so I, I don't. I should have looked it up so I could have sounded smarter. I, I know more words by sight than by mouth. And, um, but the idea is, it's what's, what's the thing that really attracts you to world building, like building wise? You know, there are some people who are like, it's the characters or it's the cultures. Those people I would call, um, I love my youngest child. There's like one thing that they really latch on and the other things they get to, but they don't necessarily go into at the same level um, that they would, the thing that they really love. And on the other end of that spectrum is the, how could you ask me to pick? I love all of my children the same. This is exactly where I'm getting this idea from, right? Because in a way, asking this question is, is saying, pick the thing that you love the most. And some people really, it's like, I love geography. I love cultures. I love people. I love everything about it. I love, and I kind of lean probably a little bit more that way, even though sort of cultures are sort of cultures and characters are both kind of eh, maybe a lean a little bit more towards them. For me, it's characters and stories. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 And, and, and you, I'd say, are definitely, I love my youngest, you know, because you love stories that have characters. And I think for you, maybe characters even more than stories. Um, mm. You love the story. It's, it's, it's a 50-50. It depends. Yeah, it, yeah because there, I would, I would. So not quite all the way to that end, but, but closer to the, I love my youngest child end, where I'm probably closer to the other end of that side. Actually, the more you say that, I will. I think I do have to agree that I like characters more because I will read a good character through a book that's not great if the character's mm-hmm. great. Mm-hmm. If so something I, really attracts you to the character, yeah, yeah. Well, because and, and just the way I've seen you develop your characters, which you do use story to do with as well. You like to write out stuff. You, you get re- you, you, you love characters, um, whether whether it's for your stuff or in someone's game world or whatever. If you're making up a character, you don't BS. No, if you ever I need help making characters, Michael's a great person to talk to because he he, he really is it, is a passion of his. Absolutely, as long as good good stories too. You know, well, the thing is, to make a good character, you have to make a good story at least for the to character. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, the rest of whatever the rest of the story is. You know, that, that's, got, too. that's got nothing to do with it. But the creation of that character has to be a decent story. Like I've you, watched yeah. shows that are really good. If I can't get into the characters, I'm done. And, and uh, the one I'm thinking of, and I'm probably going to, it's, what is it? It's, uh, I think, Six Feet Under. It was like this acclaimed show. And everyone's like, you have to watch this. It's a wonderful show. I really could not get into any of the characters, and I was done. And it, and maybe it was as great of a show as everyone said. Construction-wise, it was made very well from what I saw. But you might I could not, not be get alone because character. I know that I did not. I wanted to get into that show. Yeah, that's how I was too. I'm like, oh, I've heard how good this is, and all it's it's available on the current streaming service I'm using. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. So exact same thing for me, but I never really got crazy into it. We we watched a little bit of it and then got away from it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, the next trait I like to go into is the inner child trait. And this is so important to know. 
And I think this is probably the most important trait that people don't think about when they start world building. Because typically, as you age, you sometimes, you definitely get more away from it than you did, uh, you know, unless you're lucky enough to keep that going, which some people might. But most people, because of work and life, you just, I don't have time, I'll do it tomorrow, I'll do it next month, I'll do it next year. And then it's been 10 years and you go, oh crap, I need to start doing this stuff again. And, um, which is very much how I was. Um, you know, and for a while I was definitely at that side of the spectrum, which I call the principal. It's, I love it, but you know what? It's time to be a grown up, hmm. do grown up things. Yep. And I think, you know, as a world builder, you might not be this way in your entire life, but remember, these are how you are towards world building. You know, so for me, for a while I was there, and I've kind of pushed back a little bit into the middle, which I like to call the, wish, the wishful youth. Like, you know, I, 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 I wish I could get back to where I was. And then, and definitely, I don't know for world building, but in general, Mike's kind of like a lost child. Michael. And I'm, except for his name. Um, you know, uh, uh, cause a child will say and come out with anything and go with it. Like, it's just the way it is because it's the way it is in their reality. And so ch- that's why children are so much better at playing. You know, uh, this is why if you could get all the world building done when you're a child, you would, you would have the best world ever because you're not afraid to go with what you think is right. As you get, learn to become an adult, sometimes you, you learn from positive and negative reinforcement, how to act. And that's what makes you an adult. But the problem is it, it, it makes it harder for you to be truly creative. So I think a lot of times when people are struggling with, I, I don't know how to be creative. I don't know if I could do this anymore. It's because they're in the principal phase and it's, they're afraid of what the way people might react to them because of the way people reacted to them at some point in the past. And, you know, I think we all, I don't know if we need to necessarily become lost children again, but we need to push back that way to be able to find the creativity to be able to truly unleash the potential of our mind. Because once you start filtering out suggestions to yourself subconsciously, you're going to find a lot harder to come up with what you consider compelling reasons when you world build, unless you end up just sort of templating off of what someone else has done. And then you're going to do that and you're going to look at your world and go, Oh, this is just derivative. But is my lost child status a good thing? Uh, For world building, definitely. Sometimes when you're at parties telling people what you think, maybe not. <laughs> and that's why I definitely know. Yeah, I've definitely life, been in that. I've definitely been in that scenario. <laughs> and it's because you're honest, right? Uh, and some people don't like honesty. You got a lot of negative reinforcement through uh, through your life. That's why a lot of people start telling white lies. Michael is much less likely to tell someone a white lie than anyone else I know. Um, I'm likely to tell li- white lies. I'm not likely to tell big ones. Hmm. Like, are, you, are you just saying that to me to make me feel better now? I'm saying that because there are times when it's more convenient to just make a, a quick stupid lie over something than hurt someone's feelings or... Um, if you don't have time to deal with the consequences. Or if, or if you don't have the time to deal with shit about it. Yeah, exactly. Yep. So the, see, he's so. starting to come towards the middle a little bit. I think I'm up towards the middle again in my life. Um, like I said, and, and you might not be this way in your whole life, you got to think about when you sit down with the pen and paper and you're trying to create, do you start filtering? And, and, and later on, when you're going back through your world, you might take stuff out of that point. But when you're being creative, just let it spill out, kind of like a first draft of a novel, right? Let the ideas spill out, and then you, you, you mesh it together in the second draft of your world, essentially. Um, even though it's not quite that cut and dry, but... You know, now I want people to take all this stuff with a grain of salt. One, the hardest person is to be honest with is typically yourself. And you're also answering these questions with how you feel now today based off of your day. When you go back and you start thinking about this, you know, if you're like me, you like to listen to stuff before you do it. Just take out a sheet of paper and write down, you know, each of the six traits. You know, I probably should start calling them traits instead of attributes because I call them attributes in one place and traits in another place. But, um, you know, the six traits, you know, 
the world building style trait, one to 10, how alien to earth based do you like to do words? Uh, the knee trait, how scripted to impromptu do you like to make things up? Uh, third, the uh, sharing trait, how uh, realistic to fantastic do you, you like the people who hear about your world to learn? Uh, number four, the creative trait, how concrete or abstract do you draw inspiration for your world building in? And number five, the omphalus trait, you know, can you not pick because they're all so wonderful or do you have your favorite child? What's that favorite thing about world building you like to do? Uh, and number six, your inner child trait. Are you that principal like I was or are you the lost child? More like Michael, except for his name where he's definitely a principal. Uh <laughs> Yeah, so uh, do that. Hmm? And we have a very special combined world building and real world task for the day. And that is to go to gardool.com slash ready. I have a free course there called the Foundations of World Building. And it kind of goes into stuff like this where it kind of helps you figure out the type of world building you are and how you can take advantage of it to get your world building finished. And it also will go through a simple exercise for world building. It'll take you through a simple world building exercise to go over how simple the process really is. So if you've been sitting on the sideline because you're a principal and you've been afraid to start, or you're a hardcore world builder like me, and sometimes you get so caught up in the minutia that you forget how simple of a task world building really is, go to gardool.com slash ready, sign up. It's a free course. It's going to actually, I was convinced to make this for you to me and people are going to have to pay there. But if you're a fan of the show, you know, and like us, you're going to get it for free because I can do it through my website too. So go to gardool.com slash ready, uh, sign up, you get access. It's like six modules. It's pretty short. Uh, like I said, world building is not hard, but you need to understand a little bit about yourself and then how simple world building is. And you have all of the tools you need to make up whatever you want to. So I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. And do you have any parting thoughts for the Michael? Um, I think you covered this one pretty well. So I don't have anything specific other than, you know, it, it all falls into the know thyself bit. Do some, mm -hmm. uh, some self-exploring to figure this stuff out because it's just going to benefit your final products. Awesome. All right. So I hope everyone has a great week. And we'll see you next week on the World Builders Anvil. Thank you so much for listening to the World Builders Anvil. We would love it if you would share the World Builders Anvil with two of your friends. And so would they. If they are unfamiliar with podcasts, then you get to introduce them to the wonderful world of podcasting. Take them to Stitcher or iTunes, or best of all, just send them to our website, www.gardul.com. That's G-A-R-D-U-L.com. Now strike while the myth rolls hot.